And now, the survival show that once survived the politics of dancing. In this episode, author and corrections officer Rory Miller returns. We discuss the realities of violence and how what you're learning to protect yourself may not be grounded in the real world. They may even end badly. Howdy and welcome to the Rabbit Hole's Urban Survival Podcast. This is episode number 288. I'm your host, Aaron, and you are in the rabbit hole. Safe and sound. A quick note before we dive into this episode, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And if you're watching this on YouTube, give us a thumbs up and ring that bell if you're into that kind of thing. Now, on to today's guest. Rory, welcome back to In the Rabbit Hole. It's, uh, I like that imagery. It's good to be here. <laughs> so last time we left off with, I guess to set the tone, passivity is not a virtue. And I think I that, absolutely agree. I'm not sure the world agrees right now, but yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I guess we'll get into this in a second as far as uh, competitive, the competitive victim sports that have become <laughs> our society these days. But I want to start this time because I don't think we really got in it last time. And, and it's a, a bit more personal to start off with, but it's how do you and, it, and I'm taking a bit from the back of the cover. How do you balance? Um, having spent so much time around so much violence and, and having spent so much headspace thinking about violence with being a hopeless romantic. Uh, okay. I was totally not prepared for that question. Good. So, um, I like, um, obviously I like being a hopeless or romantic. I like the fact that I'm I'm uh, still in love with the person I fell in love with 30 odd years ago. I'd have mm. to do math in my head that, um, that sometimes you just need to tilt at a windmill mm -hmm. that there's, there's some stuff out there. And sometimes it's, and I, I get a little despair because there's some stuff like that, that passivity is a virtue that seems so big and so monolithic. I don't know how to fight it, but we have to try even when it's impossible. We have to try. And I like that resonates with me. And I, it's, you know, I go into my, you know, analytical brain where I spend a lot of time. It makes no sense. But the deeper self really resonates. And if you aren't, this is good. I'm going to mix metaphors so hard. <laughs> um, but, you know, resonance and, and string theory and guitar strings is something that's not making your life hum making you feel like there's a, a note that runs through it. You aren't living right now. Mm. You're, you're just kind of, so it, it keeps me going. It's one of those and, and hitting it the other way. I'm hitting it nine, nine different directions. Um, when you spend time around bad people, it's really easy to think that the world's bad. Mm. It's, it's really easy to take that sampling error. Um, one of my early mentors, and I, I've said this and written about it so much, but he said that the trouble, the reason most cops were out is when you spend 90% of your time with the worst 3% of people in the world, you start thinking 90% of the world is like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not. And, but if you, if you let your head there, if that's all that you think about and you don't think about, um, it, it can very easily look like they're winning. Mm. If you only spend time with them, you have to sit there and look at, you know, the world has gotten so much better just in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. And that's not what the news presents because, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. But when you yeah. look at the numbers, you know, poverty is decreasing. Violence is decreasing. Uh, life ex life um, expectancy is increasing. Infant mortality is decreasing. Education is increasing. Humans actually are doing really, really good right now. And something about that seems to drive us to put a lot of our headspace in the worst things that we see every day. Mm. It's, you know, whichever side of the political spectrum you're on, whatever you see on Facebook is just the worst 2% of whatever you're looking at. Yes. You know, and, and I think I'm glad you brought up Facebook because that sort of leads me to the next one, which is. And I alluded to it a moment ago that society in a lot of ways has turned being a victim into a competitive sport, particularly mm -hmm. on social media. But there is, I think there's a danger to it. And you hinted at it 
at it in your book or more than hinted at it in your book, Meditations on Violence. Yeah. What is the actual danger of people taking that stance and associating themselves and their mindsets with being a victim constantly? It, the victim, the passivity, this all ties together. Mm-hmm. And of course, everything I'm about to say is my opinion. There's no, um, but part of that is once you've decided that you can't solve your own problems, whether it's because you're too weak or you're victimized or you're damaged or whatever, you delegate that responsibility to somebody. If you can't feed yourself, either you're going to starve or someone else is going to feed you. If you can't defend yourself, either you're going to die or someone else is going to defend you. And the more you delegate, the more you infantilize yourself, for want of a better word. Mm. It's, I mean, that's pretty much how we define children as children are the humans that can't take care of themselves yet. Mm-hmm. And we're, we're extending that into the future. So that's becoming a baseline we're making. And, and people can look at the wonderful thing about children, the whole, you know, the creativity and the joy and, and the running around and kids are awesome. But they also forget that the kids are afraid of the dark. They don't know how to cook their own food. They don't know how to take care of themselves. They're dependent. Mm-hmm. And, um, and one of the side rants on that, I don't think we're going to go into now is one of the things about living in large groups in cities is dependence becomes the norm. Mm. Oh, that's a really good point. Yeah. You, you, there's no way to get enough food for everybody in a city or to remove your waste. And so it becomes just accepted normal for someone else to take care of that for you. Well, if they're taking care of that, why not have them take care of this Yeah. and this and this and one of the things that, that people skip is the two ways to subjugate people. We're all worried about coercive subjugation, but subjugation by dependence is, is more common, easier, and it's still subjugation. Mm-hmm. In a lot of ways, much more powerful subjugation. Uh, yeah, because people beg for it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. People, people are literally begging for masters. Yes. When, when you, yeah. And that, that's one of the, again, that, that goes into a whole political rap, but for the first time, one of the things I saw in, uh, and, and maybe I'm missing it, um, but I saw the Occupy movement as a huge shift. Because up until that time, most of the protests and that I've been aware of were about, you know, over the draft or whatever. Mm-hmm. They were over trying to decrease government intervention in people's lives. Um, the Occupy movement was a sea change. It was asking for an increase in government intervention in their lives. Mm-hmm. They, they were literally riding for a heavier boot on their neck mm-hmm. and not seeing it that way at all. There is a lot of that lately. And I think, you know, and you mentioned this a second ago, and even you had a great quote in the book, never ever delegate responsibility for your own safety. I see that so much. I mean, I see that also in, in a broader scope than, than just the violence. And so a lot of what mm-hmm. we deal with is, is a broader scope of just being prepared for, for a lot of things, um, a lot of different kinds of catastrophes, but that is so true. And you see so much of society these days begging for more control and begging to be controlled and bet begging, as you put it, to be subjugated more. Yeah. It, part of that. And all, all this ties in, you asked the perfect question because so much of it ties in together. Um, one of the things about victim power and the, the victimhood Olympics right now <laughs> is um, th- there is power that comes with victimhood. You can totally shut down any nice people just by saying, you know, I'm triggered. We need to not talk about this or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but because humans in general, I can't remember if we talked about it last time, but um, the whole power corrupts concept. Mm, I don't think so. Okay. It, it's, it's one of the things that, that hit me a while ago and I've, I've talked about it enough that I feel like I've talked about it with everybody. Mm. Um, but it, uh, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely mm-hmm. powerful men are almost always bad men. I cannot think, and, and people just hear it and they, they accept it. But can you imagine a better way to keep good people weak than to tell them they'll magically turn into bad people if they get strong? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing with money. Money is evil. Sure. And yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's one of those people start feeling morally superior because they're weak. And with the victimhood Olympics, that victim power is our only right now in our society, it's our only morally acceptable power. Mm. Mm. So you feel not only like you can control situations, but like you're a better person doing it. 
And that, yeah. that self-righteous, that feeling of being morally good, there's, I can't remember who said it, but it's one of those, almost every other source of evil has limits. Greed has limits, but when you start feeling self-righteous and you're doing it for their own good, there's no limits on evil. Mm, that is really true. And I think, wow, that's heavy. Yeah, that's good stuff. What, to start taking this more into the violence aspect of things, and I think this is something that a lot of people in general need to be woken up about. So we'll start getting into this violence. Uh, as you put it in the book, violence for most of us is unknown territory. Why is mm -hmm. that so important for people to understand, particularly people who concern themselves with self-defense? Because people make judgments about it. Mm -hmm. And then those judgments get enacted into policy. And when the policy is based on an imaginary assessment of the situation, the odds that the policy changes are going to be positive or about zero. Mm -hmm. It, um, we had something, this goes back to the urban rural divide, like a lot of places, um, I live and lived in a state where there were two, um, urban centers that could outvote the entire rest of the state. Yeah. Um, someone decided that it was unfair to hunt cougars with dogs. Hmm. So there was a big thing. They kicked up a lot of stuff and they outlawed hunting cougars with dogs. Okay. It's about the only way to hunt cougars. Mm -hmm. uh, cougars are smarter than you and they're sneakier than you. Yes. Um, so in that process, we had an explosion in the cougar population, which had a huge effect on the deer population. And they started showing up in urban areas. Mm, I see where that they, was going. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then to combat that state fish and game had to hire hunters from outside the state to hunt the cougars with dogs <laughs> it was so a whole bunch of people never spent a night in the woods and everything they got about nature they learned from disney <laughs> changed changed a policy for a state that had a horrible ecological impact mm. um and, and so um, this this is graspable, and it was really nice because it all happened in, in one place at one time. Easy to look up the documentation on it. Um, violence, because when it comes up, it's a fluke. It's sometimes harder to see the connection. But we have these stupid ideas about violence. Um, one of the ones that was really common for a long time is that kids act out because of low self-esteem. Mm -hmm. And, and to some extent, I'm sure with some of them, that's true, but super high end violent criminals have some of the highest self-esteem ever, ever measured. Yeah. Yeah. And when you increase their self-esteem, you increase their violence because they're already hurting people because they feel they have the right to, because they're better than the people they're hurting. Mm -hmm. You make them feel even better about themselves. You just confirm the fact that they were right. But when you don't understand that and you have these sound bites, you start doing solutions that are going to backfire on you. Um, the super basic understanding of violence that most people, the conflict that they've seen has been, you know, interpersonal Two people, you know, challenging and arguing and talking. And they think it's like that. They, they extrapolate that to all other forms of, of violence. And it's not a lot of violence is about hunting. It's not about a show or a display. You don't see it coming. So we sit there trying to calm someone down who's already calm. He's just planning on gutting you. Mm. And this, this can go on and on and on. Right. From a more personal level, what is it that people individually who train for self-defense need to understand about, um, about this, that violence for most of us is unknown territory? A, a lot. Um, the, the things I focused on in, in the book you're talking about meditation on violence was it's harder, faster, closer, more of a surprise. Mm -hmm. Most people, most martial artists, you know, they, they take their clue from sparring or from tournaments, mm -hmm. you know, whatever that is. And the one thing about any match at any level is, you know, it's coming. And that in and of itself is so vastly different than not knowing it's coming. That a lot of the lessons don't cross over. Mm -hmm. um, it's as hard as they want to fight in the UFC. They're still going to start out of reach with one, uh, both people knowing it's about to happen using the same tools. Mm hmm. If you were a bad guy trying to take someone out, you would never afford them those choices. Mm -hmm. um, that's part. Second part, um, almost everyone getting into self-defense or martial arts or whatever 
when they first get in, they're naive consumers. Right. They don't know good stuff from bad stuff. Unless they reach out, unless they're very, very lucky, a lot of training just turns them into sophisticated, naive consumers. They still don't know <laughs> anything, but they think they know. Right. And that's possibly the most dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I think most people getting involved, they have, to, they have to be able to deal with surprise. They have to understand that fighting is a contact sport. That's one, you know, boxing, wrestling, MMA, Muay Thai, those all have a huge advantage because you're actually going to get punched. I think most of the people I know that are actually really good started in either American football or rugby. Hmm. Cause that's, that's one place where even as a kid, you learn to take a hit and get back on the plan. Mm -hmm. um, so surprise contact. Um, and there's also, and this is one of the hardest for almost anyone. Okay. Sources of information. They have to be able to look at baseline stuff and see whether that compares with what they're learning because that's huge mm. what another great line in here that ties into this there is a gap between reality and fantasy and that gap is where novelists play i see that yeah. dichotomy a lot in uh in post-apocalyptic fiction and mm. even see people buying into stuff that it's like no that wasn't true the novelist was just selling you a story and it's fine it's a novel it's not reality but that has serious implications when we start talking about violence the different that that gap can you speak to that for a second one of the reasons that that's dangerous is people get most of what they think they know from entertainment mm -hmm. so um novelists movies sports one of, one of the things i'm finding i i would have a real tough time reading fiction most fiction I wind up throwing against a wall at some point. <laughs> uh huh. Um, but I found out I like the noir stuff from the, the like sixties and seventies. Okay. The, the John D McDonald, the, um, but I'm sitting there looking at the, the background and John D McDonald was OSS in Burma. Mm. Um, when you transition up to, to most of the people of my generation, just below, you know, their first, you know, uh, Sylvester Stallone's first blood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So up until that point, things were written by vet about that timeline. Things start, started being written by protesters. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's a whole bunch of stuff that happens in a, a Travis McGee novel that, or, uh, the, the first, the actual Ian Fleming, James Bond, mm -hmm. um, after the man with the golden gun, he was, James Bond was in the hospital doing physical therapy for two years. Hmm. Okay. And that Fleming had been a courier in World War II. Mm -hmm. So it was one of those, the people that knew stuff had stuff like that, like consequences. Mm -hmm. um, you get into that later generation where it's all fantasy. And then we're getting in our third or fourth generation where you have most of the people writing novels now their only experiences with other people's novels who only had experience with other people's novels. Mm -hmm. So it's like three or four generations of inbred fantasy. <laughs> so, I like the way you just said that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So a good novels can play in the gap because there's a whole bunch of things. If you wrote violence in a book, the way violence happens most of the time, um, it would be completely non-dramatic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. The last thing you want if you're actually doing a hostage rescue is drama. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah, don't want to take any chances. But yeah, I've had a few uh, friends that are former spooks and they've all joked around and said, yeah, it's not James Bond. None of us are good looking. We're usually we're usually picked because we are we don't look like anything and we blend in. And if you fired your gun, you've probably done something truly, truly bad. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's not, Absolutely. not like the movies. And I think yeah. and I think that brings up another great thing that you had in there about the rhinoceros and the unicorn. And I was like, that is hysterical. I never knew where unicorns came from, or at least the myth. Um, yeah. And it did speak a lot to the theory of self-defense. Can you speak to that for a moment? I, I just have to say first, I'm not allowed to name things. OK, because the rhinoceros and the unicorn would have been the name of that book if I'd left my own devices. And <laughs> I, I would, I, I would have read it if it, yeah, no, I, I like it. I don't think, 
anyone would pick off of the shelf. The the violence dynamics seminar I wanted to call the BD clinic. <laughs> um so yeah, there's a hard and fast rule. I'm not allowed I was not allowed to name our children. That was for sure. <laughs> I love it. Nifty and Swifty, I think those would be great names for kids. I, I, I'm gonna agree. I'm gonna agree. They they live next door to uh what is it, Wacko, Yakko, and Dot. Right. Yes. Yeah, my wife my wife's actual comment was do you realize that naming children is different than naming cats, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> and speaking so. of cats, so unicorns and rhinoceroses. <laughs> All right. So and, and that was the people clean things up. They um and, and part of it goes into People tell stories and narrative. That's one of the reasons we like novels. But there's no dialogue that actually sounds like dialogue because everyone has the ums and the ers and the ahs, and right. you just don't type those out. So it goes into the script and it goes into the movie. And people in movies don't talk like regular people, but we're so used to it, we don't notice that. And violence is the same thing. It's scary and chaotic. Mm-hmm. And chaos is one of the things that, that scares people most. There's some really good stuff coming out. Um, I got it. I, I listened to a lot of podcasts, but the Freakonomics podcast, mm-hmm. yeah, it's a good um, one. I went through their entire archive and one of the, the most valuable things I find is they pointed out that unknowns are bigger disincentives than risks. Hmm. Uh, walking into a dark room that you can't see is scarier than walking into a room that's full of dangerous stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so we try to demystify something that's inherently and it's not uh this is what it is. it's not inherently mystical but we make it mystical to make it special and then we try to demystify it mm. um and that so that's a double whammy of uh i'll call it horseshit for right now sounds good but it's a, it's a double whammy of compound horseshit and then that's what people wind up dealing with mm-hmm. and so in the context of all of this it's basically a lot of what we think we know about violence for people like me, we'll say, who um, don't deal with violence on a regular basis mm-hmm. or even violence is contextual. Um, you know, it's absolutely you have experience with one kind of violence doesn't mean you have experience with all kinds of violence. And I think absolutely. that was another big thing I took away from the book that I really enjoyed. And it was like, that makes yeah. perfect sense. And it's I won't go down the rabbit hole of a similar thing that drives me nuts that gets spread out there. But I, I felt I felt that was really great. And I think another thing that you said in there that's um, in the book that really speaks to this and maybe drives it home and and I think is going to ruffle some feathers for some people, hopefully, um, you said uh, sparring in school has very little <clears throat> has very limited application to what happens on the streets. Can yeah. you speak to that? Oh, hell yeah. Um, <laughs> I thought you might be able to. I, well, all sparring starts at whatever, whatever the range is for that particular system. Mm-hmm. It starts at one long step out of that range. Mm-hmm. It starts with the guy in front of you. It starts with some agreed upon techniques and also agreed upon disallowed techniques. Um, once you throw away classes, it gets even less realistic. And everything in there is designed not to do permanent injury. Mm-hmm. Um, almost, no, I, I cannot think of any of those elements that is in common with someone really trying to take you out. Mm-hmm. Uh, one, one of the, um, God, I wrote an article a while back on resistance. And it, it started with, someone did the, I know it works against full resistance because they, they do um, a high contact sport. And it's like that full resistance, which I've experienced, is absolutely nothing like an assault. Mm -hmm. So someone who's decided to just go full offense from surprise. In in any sport thing, there's a balance between offense and defense. And one of the differences in players is is where they put that balance. Um, Once someone goes all offense from surprise, they don't hold anything back to defend themselves because they rightly assume that odds are you aren't going to be able to do anything back. So why bother? Mm. So that full on assault is completely different. So they call it full resistance, but it's actually sports resistance. Hmm. Um, and within, within sport, there's a, there's a level of full resistance where someone is only being defensive, you mm-hmm. know, rope a dope. Oh yeah. Rope a dope. Okay. And, and that's one of those, that's what full defense looks like. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, or full resistance. 
is trying to get the person so overconfident they make a mistake that you have to have the edge and see it coming to make that work. Mm. You know, most people are not doing it for the reasons in sport. Um, in sport, you're trying to prove you're better at whatever it is. You're mm -hmm. trying to prove you're a better grappler, better boxer. Um, if someone's trying to take you out, it's usually because they want something. Mm -hmm. And and they aren't trying to prove they're better at anything. They're just trying to get that thing as safely as possible. Mm -hmm. And it's so again, I, I use this analogy a lot, but it's a lot more like hunting than it's like fighting. Mm -hmm. They they set you up. Um, there's also going back to resistance, they can attack you asymmetrically. I can square off with you and uh and whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen. Or I can stand there and say, yeah, my partner has your kids. Mm -hmm. Are you going to do what I'm going to, uh, yeah. Are you going to do what I'm going to say? Or are we going to, or are you going to hear one of your kids scream for a while? Right. You know, and I think another thing that you put in the book was, uh, where you, I mean, this speaks to another part where you were talking about that there's no sportsmanship in real violence. I, it's a mistake. Sometimes you get someone that, that tries to, mm -hmm. um, but it's almost always a mistake. Mm-hmm. One of my friends is the most recent. This happened to me too. Is I not me? I'll, I'll talk about myself. Um, almost every time my back hit the ground in a real fight, I would revert to tournament judo, and totally subconscious, I would be going for a pin. Mm -hmm. I'd be going for a pin or a submission, and every time I did that, I extended the encounter and increased my chances of being injured. Huh. It was one of those when someone is going for biting and gouging and clawing and trying to get your eyes and their friends might get involved and you're trying to do an Osaikomi 30 second pin, which since the rules changed 25 seconds now, you know, when I started, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, it's, it's a bad strategy, it's mm -hmm. bad tactic. but it's become, uh, uh, something came up recently to someone put up a video of me and someone was going, Oh, look, Rory, Rory's using punches. He says not to use punches. He, that's the problem. I'm really, really bad early training. And I still revert to it. Mm -hmm. hmm. That's, and I mean, that makes sense. And I know that was, that was when, the, when I was, when I was still in jujitsu and I was training with Sensei Craig, that was since I never, I didn't spend much time in judo. I, I, I didn't, I liked jujitsu. I didn't really care for judo. I appreciated judo. I didn't really care for it that much, but I was there for different, I wasn't there for sport. Um, yeah. and it was interesting the way he handled jujitsu versus judo and judo was, Hey, don't hurt each other. And jujitsu was don't hurt each other. Cause we got to come back tomorrow, but stop doing that. That way you need to take the technique as far as you can, because if something, if you ever experience a real encounter, then all you're doing is training a bad habit mm -hmm. and we are not, yeah. jujitsu is not competition. So, well, and if you look at all the people you don't injure when you do your training, mm -hmm. that's your bad habits. Yeah. 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 I think, you know, and I think that to, to move this to the next, um, part of that, which is, uh, another great quote from the book. If there has been little conflict, uh, in the life, the character or identity is mostly fictional. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that? It's a, that's a, I want to say it's a long metaphor, but basically, yeah. um, who we think we are is a story that we tell ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um, one of, one of the things within, within any kind of fiction or dramatic writing is, is it's about the conflict. If there's no conflict in a story, a, it's not a story, it's a vignette. And B it's probably boring is how much bad language can I use? Cause I want to say as boring as. Uh, that's fine. That's fine. Um, I'll just mute okay. it. Yeah. Use whatever cool. you want. I'll, I'll clean it up later. All right. Cool. Um, cause <laughs> that's, that's one of the non-conflict is by definition boring. Mm -hmm. So if, if you haven't had any real conflict, you've invented it, you've made it up. And this goes back to the victim profile. You get people that are, that feel they were victimized because they weren't treated special. Mm -hmm. Um, I saw one, um, the first time I heard the word cis in, in respect to gender, I had to go look it up. Oh yeah. Cause, cause I knew what it meant in chemistry. Mm -hmm. Um, and the first article I ran off was someone talking about how, um, before she was born, her or his or whatever parents and doctor had conspired 
to psychologically damage her Mm -hmm. by not somehow psychically understanding what gender the person wanted as an adult and altering it in the womb. Okay. All right. So completely, but someone has to work really, really hard to feel that as a victimization. Yeah. So, and I realized I probably just hit a whole bunch of people's buttons and stuff, but, but this probably is one not of the with things. this audience, but yeah, continue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but this is one of the things, if you have to work that hard to think, to, to look for people oppressing you, you aren't that oppressed. Yeah. If, if you have to go to, if you have, if you have to spend um, 10 weeks in a college course to realize that you're being aggressed upon, you probably aren't being aggressed upon. Yeah. When, when someone is actually hurting you, you know it. So. Um, how does this apply to to our everyday lives or thinking in the terms of violence and self-defense well, within that within that thing about um your character's imaginary yeah. you know everyone's a hero in their own story and we've right. all heard that almost everyone thinks that they have certain heroic traits mm-hmm. they they think they're more determined than they actually are they think they're tougher than they actually are they think they're more righteous than they actually are and until you've been in a position to stand up and have it fail, it's fiction. Mm-hmm. And when your character, as you understand it, is mostly fiction, it's not a good thing to count on under stress. Mm. Two more things. One, which is since you did have to, being on a cert team and doing all this other mm-hmm. stuff, um, and not the civilian cert team that. Uh, some people think of, but uh, in in a corrections setting, yeah, dealing with criminals uh, that are behind bars. Mm-hmm. When you had to confront your own stories, what was that like? And I, I don't just ask it to get personal. I ask just a, as learning for the rest of us who don't don't have that opportunity. It's um, that's something that's something I want to hit actually fairly hard mm-hmm. because. One of the things, um, and it, it's come up a couple of times, um, you get, you get people come to seminars, you get martial arts students, you get whatever, and it's especially young men, but it's not all. And they have this, I want to be tested. Mm-hmm. I want to know. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing is of, of, and you know, this again, sampling error, I don't know everybody, but the people I know, they're actually really experienced don't feel tested either Hmm. because no matter what we've been through, there's other people who've been through stuff we can't even imagine. The only time that we'll ever feel tested is when we die and, and fail the test. That's the only way, you know, because there's always another edge out there. Hmm. So there's that whole, um, that obsession with, you know, know who, who you are, if, and when, I don't see a lot of in people that have been through lots of if and whens because they know it's not an answer. Mm-hmm. It's not an end point. And so, and so within that, I think if to, to answer the question directly, you know, the, the hitting the edges of my envelope, um, the edge of my envelope is pretty imaginary. Mm. Um, the, I, I try as hard as I can not to have a narrative or a story or an identity because it only locks me into some something that can't be true anyway. Hmm. So um, it's one of those, it's probably the most complicated non-answer you've had on the, on the show yet. Oh, I've, I've had some doozies, but that's a good one. That's that ranks yeah. up there in the top, uh, at least the top three. Cool. What, so to put a head on it, mm-hmm. and did you find that you were willing to go darker or less dark? than you ever thought when Um, you were, we'll say tested in those, in those instances. Different. Okay. Um, in that uh, one, one of the things I found out fairly early on is that I turn my brain off and let, or my conscious brain off and let my, my hind brain deal with it. It's better at fighting than I'll ever be. Mm -hmm. Um, but within that afterwards and the thing, I don't think I, I ever in a fight did anything I was ashamed of later. Okay. Anything I was afraid would show up in the paper. So, uh, for whatever reason, my internal ethics and my expressed ethics are pretty closely in alignment. Hmm. Um, the, the two things I feel that I've failed at the, the two things that still bug me 
you know, 20 years later, um, were both instances of, I knew the right thing to do. And I let myself be overridden by, by an authority figure, Mm -hmm. um, where I, I followed rules, you know, I followed policy and twice someone died Mm. and, and I knew it was going to happen. And, and this is one of the, you know, the one thing I still, I've been rooting at it and picking at it. And I hope if, if the opportunity or the situation happened again, I wouldn't. Mm-hmm. Um, but at a point in my life where I thought I didn't really have a sheep gene, I totally still had it. Yeah. Authority is, authority can be much mm-hmm. stronger force than, than some people think, even those of us who are hard headed and rebellious yeah. to begin with. Why? Well, we, we had, one, we had a guy going into a coma, clearly, I mean, serious concussion and I'm all for calling an ambulance and the, the MD said, no, hmm. it's a, he'll, he'll be fine. It's a drug reaction. Hmm. And, hmm. That's, yeah. that's tough. What, yeah. how do you speak of this often in the book, meditations on violence? the advantages of a predatory mindset. But a lot of what we've talked about today that, that hopefully people have gotten is that what they think about violence and, and the stories they've told themselves may not be so. How, mm-hmm. from a practical standpoint, how do we train or develop that predator mindset and get it to kick in when needed or increase our odds of it being, of it happening? Uh, so my preference, and this will actually work with your audience, mm-hmm. hunt. Mm. It's I one of, and this is an old thing. One of the one of the things I read a long time. I don't even remember where was it. One of the reasons our greatest generation was our greatest generation was when they went to war. Most of them had been hunters, hmm. and and they understood rifles. They understood moving quietly. They understood not taking chances, taking the shot. So that hunting is the thing that we're missing Mm -hmm. and we tend to conflate hunting and fighting and they're totally different. Mm -hmm. So at least getting that experience. And then, um, you you can't know how much social conditioning anyone else will have, but just understanding that, that, that mindset, everything you do to bag a deer also works on people. Mm. True. Um, and it's, but you have to, yeah, but you have to switch your brain. Mm-hmm. We can't have, you know, and, and we talk about this sometimes in class, you know, have you ever butchered a large animal or slaughtered a large animal? Yes. Okay. So you didn't have to convince yourself it was a bad animal. You didn't give it a chance. You didn't, there, there's all these mental things we do when we're working ourselves up to confront a human being that we never even consider hmm. when we're, when we're about to make it an 800 pound steer into lunch. Interesting. That is really interesting. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's, and it, it's all internal. That, hmm. that entire thing is internal and it doesn't have to be lethal. I'm a little worried when I say that people, well, yeah, of course it's easy to kill people. But when you go into that mindset with handcuffing, um, one of the things that happens in a fight that shouldn't happen when you're a professional, um, a fight is a very close ad- analogy, analog mm-hmm. to a conversation or to an argument. Right. And one of, one of the things people do subconsciously in almost every fight is to give the other person a turn. Hmm. And it's one of those when you just go into explosive full motion, what, what some people call is constant forward pressure. Mm-hmm. Um, if you do that properly, the other guy, his, his OODA loop gets spiked between the, the observe and orient stages and he never breaks out next. He doesn't get a chance. Uh-huh. Uh, and Lauren Christensen wrote sometime a long time. There are only so many beats in a fight. If you fill all the beats with your stuff, he doesn't have a turn. Uh. And, and it's, and that's that mindset. It works just as well for handcuffing as it does for, for hunting. Hmm. But you have to flip a switch in your head, which I think everyone has, but they've all been socially conditioned to think that they can't. Right, right. Be be nice to everybody. Yeah. 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 Or or one one of the most stupid things we do is we make a fighting special and we start talking about warriors and bullshit like that. Mm Mm-hmm. And this is, you know, your your great grandmother probably took care of herself pretty damn well. Mm Mm-hmm. Because she had to. It's not something that only special people can do. It's something that everyone can do. Mm-hmm. Everyone has, or all of our ancestors have done it. But we make it special. We we, we make people think it's out of reach, and it's not. Hmm. 
I think that's a great place to stop because I think that's something that people need to dwell on. The book is Meditations on Violence. I cannot recommend this enough to the audience. I, Rory, I, I, I really enjoyed Calm Calm and I really enjoyed Meditations on Violence. I can't wait to read the rest of your stuff too. Cool. Where do people go to learn more about you, training, books, Read your bio about your long walks on the beach uh, and sword fighting. Long walks and, on the beach, yeah. yeah. Sword fights on the beach yes, are awesome. Yes. Um, I have a a webpage at curontraining.com, dot com. C H I R O N training. And um, I have just I, I used to have a blog for a while, and I just got I don't know if you want to hear this, but basically. Some of the comments were so stupid. <laughs> no, on the and, internet, no, never. Uh, no, it, it just wasn't, and it, it wasn't malicious or bad or, or dumb. But it, but someone actually said something, and it was gibberish. Uh-huh. I've gotten and it, those. It, it take years. It would have taken years of education to make someone think that was a reasonable statement. Because mm-hmm. um, it was um, grammatically and syntactically, it's the same as saying chocolate is the opposite of evil. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay. And it's it just like, and, and I had this whole despair moment of if someone can say nonsense at that level and not recognize this nonsense, I gave up on the human race. Mm. I resigned. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, but I can't not write. Mm-hmm. So I did just open a Patreon page. Mm. So Patreon and Kieran training. Okay. should be able to find it. I haven't figured out how to make the link yet. I'm not very much a tech guy. I got you. I got you. But they can uh, get to it through your website. I'm uh, not yet. Okay. I hadn't thought of that. Thanks. All right. All right. Gl- <laughs> That's what I'm here for. Suggestions. Cool. <laughs> Give us the website address one more time, dude. Uh, Curon Training. C-H-I-R-O-N training.com. Awesome. Thank you so much, Roy. I really appreciate cool. you sharing your knowledge with us. Good to talk to you again. You too, man. Show notes, resources, and links from this episode can be found by going to in the rabbit hole.com slash E288. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, just look in the description section below this video. And speaking of YouTube, if you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to do all that YouTube stuff. Throw us a like, subscribe, and slap that bell around because bananas are yellow. With that, we wrap up episode number 288 from the Lone Star State. Till next time, stay safe and sound. Westbrook.